Well, it's my great pleasure to be the MC for this afternoon. And during the next uh, hour, we're going to explore two sessions. The first is going to be, in a way, what are the messages that came from uh, the sessions today? Uh, you will have not had a chance to visit all of those sessions, so we give you an overview of that. And from that come, what are the key findings that are coming out from that? And that's going to be very helpful in informing the strategy development we wish to pr uh, present to the minister uh, in the next six months or so, so through the uh, Ag Tech Advisory Group. So to kick off, let me introduce our, our first uh, panel men members uh, to explore the opportunities and barriers to adoption of Ag Tech uh, into uh, um, production, in, particularly in South Australia, but not exclusively. First, can I welcome Dr. Andy Lowe. Andy is, I'm going to give you a very brief introduction because you've probably heard all these before anyway through the sessions. Andy is the inaugural director of Agri-Food and Wine at the University of Adelaide, and uh, he was formerly the science director of the Fight a Food Waste Cooperative Research Centre. Please join us up here, Andy. And we thank uh, him for being the chair and facilitator of the farm management stream today. And our second me panel member is Ollie Madgett. Uh, Ollie brings a digital and IT background, which he has now successfully applied to the ag sector through his uh, family vineyard, uh, first to address his own issues in uh, ag production and uh, effective land management, uh, but now offers uh, demonstration facilities on that farm as well. Uh, he also runs the Adelaide Ag Tech me uh, Meetups, which is a member and is a member of the Agri Futures Ignite panel. Welcome to us, Ollie. And uh, Ollie was the chair and facilitator of today's remote sensing stream. And Tom Rayner is our third panel member. Tom is currently the Vice President of Sales, as well as a number of other functions, uh, at the satellite communications company Miriota, which has significant applications in the ag tech sector, uh, as well as a very strong involvement with the, the whole space sector and our new uh, space uh, SAT CRC. Tom has previously worked with elders, uh, and also is a fifth-generation farmer uh, of a wheat and merino sheep farm in the, the mid-north. And we thank uh, Tom for chairing today's Internet of Things device stream. Now, finally, I would like to introduce another member who uh, was not a, a chairing one of the sessions but has a lot to offer to us, and that's uh, Emmy, Emma Leonard. She's the editor of Precision Ag News and owner of Agri uh, No. Emma is a Nuffield farming scholar and Churchill Fellow, and she's currently undertaking a PhD on the topic very close to our hearts, overcoming the barriers to adoption of digital agriculture. So Emma will have a lot to offer. Welcome, everyone. OK, so I'm now going to move from here and, uh, and uh, start the panel session. Thank you, and I'd like to start by asking the, each of the three panel members what the key uh, themes were that came out of their sessions today, because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of overlap, but probably some individual ones. Uh, Andy, we'll start at the end. Yeah, thanks so much. So I was uh, chair of the farm management system, so we had six uh, presentations uh, over the course of the day. So Ag World, looking at collaborative farm management, Field In, managing on-farm data, AgriWeb, livestock management, uh, data management, TIUB, end-to-end uh, -end data in farming, P2P Agri, which is really around financial and farm management, and then Swan Systems, uh, irrigation and nutrient management. So across those six presentations, we had a, a diversity of issues, uh, and they, it was really a software solution uh, that was being provided to allow key data that's derived either from input from the farmers or from employees around the farm or from uh, data systems that are collecting the data into uh, a decision-making uh, framework. So, I mean, one of the key messages for me, Liana, was that uh, Agritech uh, is already here <laughs> within uh, systems. Farmers are actively adopting uh, a lot of these software systems and a lot of these software systems have been running for 10 years and have been iteratively updating uh, given input from, from the farmers. Uh, there's a lot of complexity uh, to farm management systems and hence why we see quite a number of different solutions that are out there within the marketplace at the moment. 
And each of those different solutions are targeting in on a particular sector. So we saw solutions that were specifically designed for the livestock sector, the cropping sector, the horticultural sector, or more around financial uh, or irrigation-based uh, systems. Um, a lot of uh, the issues really, uh, all uh, production systems really emphasize the importance of getting farmer input or producer input for the design. And we actually saw quite a few testimonials uh, in the presentations from farmers or producers uh, that uh, were saying how good some of that interaction uh, had been. It's clear that a lot of these uh, systems need good support and uh, uh, software and the design of those. And with, with the support and training, also comes an opportunity for those that are developing the systems and the software to engage with farmers and producers and update uh, those systems. That's definitely uh, a positive uh, and also something that was emphasized, I think, in all six uh, uh, presentations. Um, the, uh, I think, uh, return on investment uh, was also a critical issue. If you're not going to present a, a system that's going to save farmers money. You're not going to get uh, buy-in to that system. And it's also really important to be able to articulate clearly what the, uh, what the benefit is. And most of the presentations that we saw had a dollar saving per hectare uh, or per product. So that was cre really clearly articulated. And I might leave it there because I've got a few other things, but I'll let somebody else talk. We can always come back to those. <laughs> um, thank you. Ollie. Um, okay, so I um, helped to facilitate the remote, sync, uh, remote sensing stream. So just some of the insights that came out of our group were, was that um, spatial data and spatial imagery, like that, like getting that isn't the challenge anymore. That used to be, you know, imaging from satellites used to be quite expensive if you used to get high resolution as a, you know, in my instance, a grape grower a few years ago. That's now come down to kind of imagery being available like across a whole season for $10 a hectare. So the price is coming, crashing down and, and it is available. So the speakers were really talking about how they're needing, and these are technology companies, how they've needed on their journeys to really drill down to creating very practical solutions for farmers for problems that, that, that they cared about. So um, one example is Hummingbird Technologies, really very advanced AI um, company that's been really, really well backed around the world. And they've come to Western Australia and the product that they've found has really gained traction is just actually just doing green on brown sensing. So just looking for weeds, summer weeds, and then creating prescription maps which are extremely frictionless to then go and apply. So they've spent a lot of time just integrating fully with John Deere so that their basically sensed weed mapping turns into really practical prescription maps and everything fits in kind of the 10 meter um, sectional control that, that they're running. So that was interesting. People like Data Farming, Tim Neal, he was very, um, you know, upfront about uptake so far. So whereas some technologies like auto steering, you know, might in certain areas of broadacre farming have an over 50% uptake. When you look at actually people making practical use of things like imagery, that's down at 4%. Uh, some of the things that he was saying was like, get humans out of the way. So a lot of the stuff that he's done, which has helped him really scale and bring down the cost, is just automating everything. So in his previous life, there used to be humans in the loop that used to have to do things. And he's like, He's just been working to build software that just automates, 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 uh, and, and tries to give farmers really sort of frictionless experiences. Um, some of the, just a couple of other quick things that I thought were really exciting were um, uh, Chibo Labs. So they're actually, um, so a lot of this, you obviously got remote sensing and you have to ground truth it. I thought Chibo Labs had done an amazing job of activating this basically army of farmers to help them ground truth some of the work that they're doing spatially. So they have hundreds and hundreds of farmers out there actually monitoring their pasture, and that helps them to kind of validate all of their data sets. So that tapping into the power of a crowd I thought was really exciting. And also the same group of people are working on a, um, a tool called My Farm Key. So a lot of the companies were saying that um, when farmers have to adopt um, farm management software or spatially orientated software, one of the tasks that you have to do time and time again is draw your blocks in. And it's interesting in the livestock industry, um, with this project called My Farm Key, they've just actually gone Australia wide and mapped 
all of the paddocks that relate to livestock, and that's going to sit in a repository which is available for other apps to tap into. So ultimately, we're kind of creating some assets that can be shared and used by lots of different technology companies, which should hopefully help to really just lower the friction when it comes to people actually adopting tech. So I thought that was really good as well. Thank you very much, Ali. Tom. Yeah, thank you. So uh, the, uh, the sessions that I was looking after were around IoT devices or Internet of Things devices. Uh, and we had a wide range of different companies presenting different technologies. Um, we had Jason Chaffee from uh, Argisons uh, who create the eShepherd product. So they have basically connected cows um, and providing uh, the ability to use uh, virtual fencing for those, uh, for those cows. Through to Rob Stevens from Centec, uh, a company that's a proudly South Australian company based here in McGill Road. Um, they're a, a maker of soil moisture probes, but now they're connected soil moisture probes. So much more than just a hardware manufacturer now, they really are a, a data company that's providing um, water insights and soil moisture insights for their customers. Um, we heard from Mike and Dan Hayes, a company called Intuit, based in Narracourt down the southeast. Um, it's interesting, their company it creates IoT networks and solves a lot of the technical problems with having access to the internet on properties so that people can access these IoT devices and roll these IoT devices out on their individual properties. Uh, after the lunch break, we heard from FarmBot, from Andrew Copen. Um, they are, again, they're a water tank monitoring company, but they see themselves as much more than that. Um, uh, Andrew described himself as a company, FarmBot, as a company that provides actionable insights for the farmers. So they have a very clear uh, understanding of the value proposition that they provide. Uh, then we heard from uh, Salah Sukahira uh, from Adjurus, uh, making... Uh, farm robots, in particular for cro row crops, um, doing all sorts of interesting application around uh, uh, the autonomous uh, detection of weeds in, uh, in row crops. And then um, we heard from Lely, uh, Rami Sanad, and a, a farmer down at Mount Gambia, Josh Clark, who's integrated and implemented a fully autonomous uh, dairy milking uh, system on their property. So a wide range of IoT technologies from the relatively simple um, tank monitoring solution through to a fully autonomous uh, dairy, if you like. Um, but they all had uh, some similar themes, I suppose. There was still an underlying theme for particularly a lot of the connected devices around a lack of infrastructure and the requirement to have infrastructure to take advantage of these technologies. And in fact, into it, you could argue their entire business exists because there is not widespread access to that infrastructure, so they actually run their business to provide that solution to farmers. And the other thing was that people were quite... All, all six companies were quite clear about what the value proposition that they were... Uh, adding to farmers, a bit like you said, Andy, they either had a dollars per hectare gain or they clearly articulated the problem they were solving. So it wasn't technology for technology's sake, they were using technology to solve a real problem. Um, and the way that they overcame the barriers to adoption for those varying types of companies was, was interesting. Um, a company like a, a Centec or a FarmBot, they very much uh, had an emphasis on creating a, a plug and play type solution, if you like. Anyone could buy one of these hardware solutions from an elders or they could go to one of their agronomists and they could implement it and make sure that it was implemented well through to um, Lely, obviously a much more sophisticated, fully autonomous robotic milking program and the way that they cover off that adoption program is they have quite a uh, sophisticated distribution network and support network around Australia and through New Zealand. So um, very interesting topic. We could have talked about it all day, um, but that's a quick high-level overview of what we uh, covered off, Liana. Thank you, Tom. Um, Emma, um, we've heard comments uh, uh, for obvious reasons about automated systems being crucial and so forth. Um, e even the, let's get the humans out the way, but I think you have a strong passion about the, the, what's the human face in all this. Um, and uh, it occurred to me, I think, from some of the talks we've heard this morning and so forth, the importance of building trust. Uh, you know, people don't, you know, if you come along and say, I've got the best solution in the world for you, um, if they don't know you, don't trust you, um, probably not going to pay much attention, whereas from their peers they trust, they will work with. So could you perhaps talk to us a bit about, to, to start with at least, about the human element? Yes, I think, um, I think there's various uh, aspects to that. One thing that comes through yet again is there's no silver bullet because all our farming businesses 
have got different motivations, different structures, different environments, different production systems. So it's so important to actually be able to work with those individual farming businesses. But it's not just the farmer. And a farmer, I just will remind people, is not only male. Do not forget when you're talking to your audience, there are women out there. I did a survey of 14 businesses and all of them talked about him all the time. But we know that a lot of women are actually the ones driving the uptake of the technology. So I'm not some raging and feminist. How, how, but many, <laughs> how many women producers do we have here today? Mm, probably not that many. No, yeah. well, it's good to see a number. Well done. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, they are in, in the equation. Um, uh, the other thing is the personalities of those people. So some are going to be big risk takers and take it up really early and be prepared to be the, um, the guinea pigs. But most are actually going to want to see it working and uh, proving a value, as, as we've said many times. But their, um, their team... Sorry, what was I actually going to say? It's not just the farmer. There's teams on the farms. And if their employees or if their advisors are not engaged with the process as well, you are very likely not to have successful uptake. So I'd really encourage people to think about the whole... We love this term now, ecosystem on the farm of all those people that might be engaged, or the ones that you can keep out of it, as, uh, as Tim said, because um, they can be the ones that are, are stopping the, the uptake. Um, but can I just talk a little bit about the value proposition issue that's Absolutely. come up as, as well? Because, um, yeah, I'm, I'm like a reformed smoker now, which is always dangerous, I know, but we always sort of say, oh, yeah, we've got to have a, a per hectare dollar, a dollar value or whatever the unit dollar value is. Absolutely, we do. But that information is important when the farmer is making a decision about adopting. But there are two stages before that that we need to remember, that they've got to have knowledge and they've got to have persuasion. And I think the, we've got over 80% uptake of um, auto steer in the broad acre cropping systems. And people go, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, it's because we've got less overlap. Well, that's what they originally sold us on. 5%, 10% less overlap if you were, had pretty odd-shaped paddocks. That's a fairly significant change in your bottom line. But really, if you think about it, what happened was farmers drove around having a sticky beak over the fence at other people's paddocks and went, wow, those are straight lines. That looks neat. How did they do it? And then they go to the, down the pub or the cricket club or whatever. Oh, you know, Joe Blow's got really nice straight lines. How'd they do it? Oh, they're using auto steer. And Joe Blow goes, well, and actually, I'm a lot less tired and I can do more hours and my back's not nearly so bad. And then they go, oh, OK, and I get a 5% reduction in input costs because I'm not getting the overlap, so it's worth me buying it. But you've got to remember all those steps. We are all humans. We all do that. Think about your buying decisions and then apply it to your potential clients. Thanks, Emma. And uh, we can open up any time for questions. So does anyone have a question? Please, at the back. Uh, I think there are some roving mics. Uh, Phil Tickle from SIBO Labs. Um, there's been uh, the question of uh, subscriptions uh, raised a couple of times and producers apparently uh, you know, being annoyed at having to um, you know, add subscriptions. And, but I haven't actually heard an other, another model actually uh, put forward uh, if, uh, if subscriptions aren't the way to go. Does anyone have a comment there? I can, um, yeah, Phil, I, I don't know. Yeah, obviously there is... Um, farmers are used to making, as you'll know, like big capital investments. They're used to kind of um, one-off costs. And, no, it is a challenge. The SAS model um, does get a bit of pushback at the moment, but, it, but obviously it's like an early stage of, of that being adopted. But it's interesting. There's, there's various people that are trying to switch who pays. So that's, yeah, like finding a viable business model which is meeting the problems we're all trying to solve is like that, that, that is the biggest challenge we all face. So obviously people like um, Tim Neal at Data Farming's gone down a freemium route. So he's made some imagery for free and then, and then charged based on usage. Um, we're seeing people definitely, there's a move towards ag tech companies seeing them like op change, switching who pays for stuff, whether it be a, um, you know, ag chem com company or or a rural service provider. So, um, but it's, that's the, as you'll know, it's the toughest challenge to, for us to overcome as an industry to make all of this actually viable based on the numbers of farmers that we actually have here in Australia. Um, yeah. I think, 
Yeah, certainly in the session uh, I was in, so farm management systems, uh, most of those systems uh, were subscription, and uh, part of the justification was that these systems are actually changing uh, really quickly. So it actually gives uh, opportunities for subscribers to change uh, within that. And because of that dynamic, there's actually a, a premium placed on then service and training that goes along uh, with those systems. So uh, look, I'm sure there are other models uh, out there that work, but subscription seems, particularly in the software systems, to be the uh, choice. Just, um can you hear me? Oh, sorry. So I suppose one of the issues that we're finding is that, and I think it's uh, the, the um, uh, maybe putting it in a context there where basically every uh, ag tech company's got their own app now and they're all chasing another 50 bucks a month or, or whatever the number is, uh, and then the producer needs 10 apps on their phone and it all adds up. I think there's a there's got to be, from a, the ag tech perspective, um, we should need to be working on APIs more than we're working on front ends and to focus on on business-to-business -business collaboration and um, and to have those sorts of models sitting underneath some more uh, overarching apps uh, that, uh, that get delivered. So really, it's I think at the moment, there's way, way, way too much focus on you know, the next sexy app uh, rather than focusing on uh, system integration through APIs. Yeah, if I can make a comment on that, because yeah, I, I tend to agree, I think the only other model that I've seen to try and work around that, if you're talking about IoT devices, is normally for the lower cost, discrete IoT devices. Sometimes they're building the connectivity into the hardware costs, so they might have a fixed cost for, a, say, five, ten year lifetime. But I think also from a hardware point of view, the guys that are doing it well are actually understanding that they're a bit, a bit silly if they think that they are going to be the app, if they're going to beat some of the multinationals by being the platform provider, they're much smarter to have those public APIs so the data can move from one platform to the other, um, otherwise they're going to be left behind. Um, if they come up with the app, then that's, that's great, but uh, there's, a, there's a fair bit of competition out there globally, not just in Australia. Again, it's not, it, th this isn't another model, Phil, but maybe it's the term subscription. I think I'm buying something, and so I you know, buy it and, and own it. Okay, I don't own it, I appreciate that, but I don't expect someone then to go and use my data elsewhere. I expect to be able to have my data so I can transfer it to a better model that comes along. Um, and I think people are very poor on that transparency. One of the things I do during a presentation, if you're seeing me looking at my phone, it's not because I'm uh, bored on Twitter, it's because I'm actually looking at your website and seeing whether you're telling me in the presentation what you're telling me on your website. And nine times out of the ten, ten you tell me much better information in the presentation than you do on your website. I have no idea half the time what you're selling me. So um, if I can really understand what I'm going to buy, maybe I'll pay a subscription. Any further questions? One over, over here, Clem. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Clem Fitzgerald, I'm uh, uh, recently appointed to the board of the Agricultural Bureau. Now, in the Agricultural Bureau across South Australia has a lot of crop, crop walks where new and innovative uh, operations are put out and farmers look at them. Uh, some adopt them and some don't. The, the challenge of this forum will be to get and adopt the exciting things that are going on. I've been around to some of these things and they're really, really, really exciting. But <clears throat> the issue, and you mentioned it, about risk. And risk in all these things is not about swinging from the windmill with a piece of rope. The risk is financial. And uh, all of these things that people struggle to get into even though they'd love to because it's a financial issue. Uh, and how you can show that this new technology is actually earning them money and then back to the bank and say, look what I did. Could you comment on that, please? I think that there's a perennial one. Uh, yeah, re uh, re no, return on investment, cost benefit, how much am I going to put in, when am I going to get a return and so forth, Clem. So that, that came through a lot. Emma? Uh, Clem, I, th I think you're absolutely right, but um, I read an article the other day and a guy said his most stressful week of the year is when he starts seeding because he's not sure whether the rate controller is going to talk to the tractor again this year. Um, so I'd actually argue reliability comes before... It, 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 it's, it's a given it's got to give me a return on investment, but it's all those other things. And I think the, the, the farm... What is it called, um, Phil? Sorry, my farm property key is possibly one of those real um, killer apps that are going to help start making some of these other things 
uh, work together and show us that they are delivering more money. But um, reliability, good support, backup, all of those things are, are just as important as the dollar value. Because if it makes me, if I have to stop doing something to make that technology work, I've lost time, not gained time. Any further questions? I'd just like to ask um, Ollie a little bit about, about his uh, networking sessions, the ag tech meetups. Uh, uh, it's, I think connectivity has been a key theme. Um, you know, and I said before, if you know someone, you're comfortable with them, um, you're more likely to uh, accept what they're saying and, and seek their advice. Um, so networking is crucial. Uh, if we try to orchestrate networking, so if the government says we're going to you know, pay for a few drinks each night and try and get people along, it ain't going to work. It seems to me in this sector, you are all taking this on board and starting to network uh, of your own uh, uh, development, so, which is a very positive sign. Uh, Ollie, would you like to give a bit of feedback on how the meets are going? Um. Yeah, well, I, I think that, well, we started the AgTech meetups in South Australia about four or five years ago, and it really came from, like, my background is in games in London, and we all used to make Facebook games, and it's what Facebook absolutely nailed when they first came to London. They didn't even have an office. They just set us up a meetup group and, and, and sort of created a platform for us to make games on top of it, and it just went absolutely ballistic, and uh, it was very exciting to be a part of that. And then... We came over to South Australia about five years ago, and it was fascinating. Like everybody's, you know, involved in agriculture a few steps away, and there was not much of a community. There are some amazing companies here doing stuff in agriculture, but there wasn't sort of people weren't collaborating and getting together. So we just thought as much just to get to know people, we'd just start meetups, uh, and it's really about just trying to bring developers and startups together with farmers and other people in the ag tech ecosystem, and it's very much from the ground up. So everybody's very welcome to join. You just have to go on to meetup.com and just look kind of ag tech Adelaide and it and it will surface. And then it's grown to about a thousand of us now. Uh, and it's good with, well, actually with the help of um, Emma, we've started to try and also go out from Adelaide. So the last one was held at lot 14 in the city and we had about 13 companies over from the UK that all got to kind of only a couple of minutes, but they all stood up and told us what they're doing and trying to make connections with people here. But Emma took us over to the uh, York Peninsula and actually kind of put on a little mini field day for us. So actually the meetup community could all get on a bus. We had an amazing day around the York Peninsula and um, Emma's helped us just to get farmers sitting in front of a group of developers and just talking about what they love and what they hate about farming. So it's often, you know, often sometimes people in tech might be working on things that farmers actually really enjoy doing, and actually we just need to listen more to farmers about what they actually hate and what really frustrates them. It might not be the sexiest thing to work on, but it's actually where we should start if we're going to try and actually create something that's viable. So um, completely open. Uh, next meetup is on the 1st of April, and it's going to be kind of about beneficial agriculture. So there's another conference coming here about climate change and, and farming. So 1st of April, it'll be at lot 14 and, and all free. We'll put on beers and pizzas and stuff. So, so come on along. Now you're talking, beer and pizza. Woo! Uh, well, look, unfortunately, we're at the end of our, our time. The time goes quickly when you're having fun. So may I thank very much our, our panel men, members and uh, also for our chairs of the sessions. Thank you so much for your time and efforts. Um, and not just in doing the sessions, but really helping to organise them, uh, the content of them, and our speakers. Uh, thank you very much for participating. Thank you.